last week I had a privilege to share with you uh, on the subject. We said the Heavenly Father's love is unconditional. And we said it was part one, and we have the second part today. The Heavenly, love, uh, the Heavenly Father's love is unconditional. And please, if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go and listen to the video. I believe it was uh, a good message from the heart of God for us all. And I really felt blessed and challenged by that, and I'm so grateful to God for this opportunity. And just rehearse again, I mean, one of the big, I mean, wonderful students is Alice. She said, she said everything that I preached last week. So in a nutshell, what we are saying that unconditional love means love without strings attached. It is love you offer freely, you simply love people and want nothing more than their well-being and happiness. This love is called compassionate love or agape love. It is absolute. It happens no matter, it will happen no matter what else happens. It is selfless. So how can anyone love like God unless the Spirit of God is with you? This unconditional love of God is supernatural. Amen. Amen. And I want to rehearse for you the objective that I told you last week, and we're still sticking to that. The objective was to bring people back to the heart of God. And the second objective is to reach out to win souls for Christ and caring for them. Amen. So let's go into what we have today to share with you. The unconditional love of God is supernatural. The unconditional love of God is, um, uh, is, is just heavenly and is just wonderful. So uh, what I would say is that the church, therefore, has to show unconditional love to others, even though they may disappoint us or reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we still have to pursue them no matter what, and show them the compassionate love of God. Did you hear that? Sometimes you want to talk to people and you've been doing everything and you know these people need Jesus. They always come into you, uncle, auntie, brother, father, this is my issue. They're always talking to you about the same issue and you know the solution is Christ. But for some reason the enemy has blinded their eyes and deafened their ears. They don't hear. And you don't even know what they want. You offer them Jesus, they don't want it. But the unconditional love pursues people. Yes? So you have to still pursue them no matter what and show them that compassionate love. You see, leading someone to Christ is a privilege and we should be, it should be the greatest joy of any person. Indeed, of every Christian. The Bible says that, I mean, the heavens rejoice, the angels rejoice when one person turns to God and accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So it is a joy for you and me to see that happen. But sadly, the passion to show that unconditional love of God to others and to win souls for Christ is diminishing in our world these days. It is diminishing. Even in the church, it is diminishing for various reasons. One is we not taking or we lack responsibility as Christians. We don't take that responsibility serious. That is our responsibility to make sure that our family, our brothers, sisters, our siblings, and our good friends also know Jesus Christ. We don't take that responsibility seriously to tell them, that, look, the love of God is unconditional. No matter what, it's not, God doesn't want you to be a nice person. God doesn't want you to be a perfect person. God doesn't want you to be the cleanest person before he accepts you. He will accept you the way you are no matter what. Amen. So God is not looking for that. If God is looking for that perfect people, then you and me will not be here. Suddenly I won't be here. Maybe you will. You will probably be alone. But I just want you to understand that God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for us for who we are so that he will literally clean us up and make us perfect or righteous because of Jesus Christ. Amen. So sometimes we lack that responsibility to, I mean, to feel that it is our responsibility to do this. Sometimes we think that it's the pastor or the evangelist's problem. That if I'm not a pastor, so I cannot tell my family, I'm waiting for Pastor Gideon to visit me at home and then tell my family that you need Jesus. No, it is your responsibility. 
We are not looking for, so that, oh, we don't have many evangelists in our church. We're waiting for the evangelists in our church to go and evangelize the people so that they can come to Jesus. It is not so. It is our responsibility as well. Sometimes the problem for us is that it is fear. We become afraid when it comes to, I mean, telling somebody about Jesus because we felt we'd be rejected. But more so, sometimes we don't know what to say. In this church, we're here to teach you what to say. We are, we, are, we are teaching people, taking people through to uh, a discipleship pathway, a new uh, uh, beginning. And through that, every step, coming to know, the, I mean, the revelation of Jesus, coming to know, I mean, why Jesus Christ died, and all this in deep, deep revelation, you come to a point that you have no reason not knowing what to say. Amen? You have every reason to know what to say because it is so powerful, it is so revealing, and it is so, I mean, uh, uh, able to save and so loving. That's what God wants us to understand. And sometimes for that reason, we, I mean, very few people actually, I mean, win people or souls for Christ. So meanwhile, those we say we love, whilst we do nothing, are dying around us without Christ. Your brothers and sisters that you say you love are dying without Christ. Your aunties and uncles that you say you love, they are dying without Christ. Your husband, your wife, and your fathers and your mothers that you say you love, they are dying without Christ. Your children are dying without Christ, and yet we do nothing. Yet we continue to live as if it doesn't matter. And the sad thing is that we hear people say, my faith is private. When people say their faith is private, that means they are unbelievers. You hear me? That means they don't even believe the faith that they are talking about. How can it be private? And then suddenly the person dies and then you want it to be a public show. Hello? You see, you see the lie of the enemy. The enemy is lying to us all the time. And we buy it. Let us reject it. Because the unconditional love of God is powerful. It's without bound. It's without restriction. No matter what, God will love us. And God loves people. So, people then... We see people then continue to live, holding on to offense and unforgiveness, which is eating them out. And when unforgiveness and offense is eating you out, you get afflicted. You get distressed in your soul. You are always angry. You are not happy. And you are always suspicious of people around you. That is what unforgiveness and affliction produces. And... It consumes you and it brings so much pain and so much anguish of your soul. If you're here and you are not happy, you're always angry, you're always suspicious of people, you're always thinking that somebody's there to get you, then there is, you have to examine yourself to start with and ask God, what is it in my heart that I'm holding on to? I want to let go because I want to experience the unconditional love of the Father. When you experience the unconditional love of the Father, it's healing. It brings healing to your soul. It brings healing to your soul. And that is what it does. The words need a touch from God to transform their lives. The world needs them. But only believers, you and I, can tell them the good news that Christ heals. Christ sets people free. Christ will restore them. It's just you and me who can do that. And that is why I said that, but who can carry this unconditional love of God unless the Spirit of God with you? That means that we have to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and say, God, first let us understand this love. Heal us first. Heal us. I mean, set us free, restore us, refresh us, so that we can also have that passion to carry the same thing out there. I could imagine the prodigal son's father, as we read last week from Luke 15, somehow along the line there was some, I mean, deep passion in him that even though my son has really gone far away from me, I don't even know where he was. At one point he thought he was dead. And yet, he was yearning to have this child back. And that is how loving, how unconditioning, and how I mean, a supernatural, this love is. So we want some restoration in people's life, want, I mean, healing in people's life, want people to be set free in their lives. Sometimes, I mean, the people that who cannot change, all that they need is the love of God, for God to show them the love and for the love of God to come to them. But then the Bible said, how can they hear the word of God unless somebody preaches to them? 
preaching, preaching uh, from the word kerygma in Greek means that unless somebody tells them, unless somebody warns them, unless somebody directs them, unless somebody teaches them, you see, because faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. You see, until they hear the word of God, they cannot come to faith in Jesus Christ. But God is not going to come from the heavens to do that. But God expects you to do that telling others. Is that okay? This is how we show the unconditional love of God. Because I always, any time that, I mean, none of my parents is alive, right? They're dead. And you'd be surprised that over 30 years, every now and then I'm thinking, oh gosh, sometimes I have flashback here and there. These are deep wounds and you need to be healed from that. But the only way that one gets healed is to know God and ask God, you know what, I'm hurt by this. I want you to heal me, right? So I want us to know that it is so important that if we're talking about unconditional love of God, then we want restoration. If the unconditional love of the Father is in us, then we should know that winning souls is at the heart of the Father. It's at the heart of the Father. We are called to win souls. We are called to win souls. Let's read something from Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. Jesus said this. Then Jesus, or he said them, uh, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. You see, the fact that we are Christ's followers and Christ has called us to follow him, then he has called us to make us fishers of men. We have to go fishing. Hello? We have to go fishing. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to go to the effort market to pay for that fish. That's why we buy our fish. That's why I'm saying that. You see, you don't have to pay. These days the prices are going so high. Let me not digress, right? Digress. Let me stay here. We have to go fishing, and this fishing is free because everything has been given to us by the love of God and the grace of God. We are going to show people love and say, hey, God has made me a fisher of men, so I am going to be a fisherman. But look at the word. It said, immediately they left their nets and followed him. So if we are Christ followers, there's got to be an immediacy in our lives. Some immediacy, something should be urgent in our lives. That immediately, when Christ has called us, when you are hearing this message being preached to you by the love of God, immediately, put down what are you doing and make sure that you become fishers of men. Remember, Christ will make you fishers of men. Amen. Now, if we saying that this is the case, and we are Christ followers, that means we are also ready to be made and become fishers of men. That means winning souls for the kingdom of God should be what? A priority for us. Because when I was reading this, I'm thinking immediately they've left everything. Yes, something became a priority for them. Fishers of men. So what is priority for you today even as you hear about the unconditional love of God? Are you going to be a fishers of men? Men in a generic form, generic form, woman, man, young, old, Whatever gender they are, you are going to be fishers of men. That means you are going to bring them to Christ. So why must we preach the gospel to people? Why must we preach? Because I always go back to the story of the prodigal son. It was so powerful. Why do we preach it time and time again? We preach it to show how much God's love is unconditional and God wants to welcome people back onto himself. So... If we ask ourselves, why should we preach the gospel, we can go back to Jesus Christ. Because the gospel means good news. Yes? It's good news. So during the ministry of Jesus Christ here on this earth, he preached the gospel of salvation. That you must be saved. There is a way that is right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And death, we are talking about spiritual death, like we were learning last Wednesday, the Sabbath pathway, and physical death. Right. Physical, I mean, spiritual death brings separation between man and God. Like Adam and Eve, they were separated from God. God said, the day that you disobey me, the day that you rebel against me, the day that you decide to do your own thing, not listening to God, you will die. And we know physically they didn't die. Most people only look at it, oh, but they didn't die. So God told a lie. No, they died spiritually. Their spirit was separated from God. 
and they were no more in relationship with God. So evangelism was Jesus' lifestyle. We as his disciples should imitate him and do the same. That is why we are called Christians, isn't it? Christians, we take his name, so we have to imitate him. Since evangelism was, was, was what was the lifestyle that he had, so it should also be our lifestyle. We, are, we have to tell others about the supernatural love of God, which is unconditional. While people live, don't wait till they die. Don't wait till they die. You can give the best sermon in the world. You can cry the best tears out of the, this world. You can give them the best send over into this world. You know something? Maybe I'm spoiling your show. They don't hear. That is reality. Sometimes we haven't come to that reality. I have some friends of mine in the WhatsApp group, and when somebody is ill, I said, oh, let's contribute 10 pounds each to help this people. I mean, this person probably even take the bus to the hospital. Nobody would do it. The person dies, and everybody is ready to put on their black clothes and donate 20 pounds. And I'm just thinking, wow, the person couldn't have 10 pounds when he is alive, but the person is dead and you have 20 pounds to give the person. What a waste. That's the reality, guys. So we have a mandate. We have a responsibility to show the love of God why people live. Don't wait till they die, for that will be too late. All around us, people are dying spiritually, separated from God. They are dying physically, eternal death. Lives are being wasted in world living and sinfulness. Yet we do nothing about it. Looking at this message, I'm thinking, oh God, have mercy on me. Oh God, have mercy on me. Because there are some people in my family that they don't know Christ. They're nice people. If you know my family, they are nice people. They are relatively quiet. They won't hurt you. But they, oh, they'll be listening, so let me be quiet. <laughs> Please, this family, I'm not talking about you, right? <laughs> let me move on very quickly. <laughs> we have a mandate from Christ. To bring back the prodigals and heal their hearts to refresh and restore them. We have that mandate. It is in this world that people's eternal destiny and purpose can be shaped or predetermined and not in the afterworld. This is the time to shape people's destiny. This is the time for you and me to tell people that the love of God is here. Because when the father of the prodigal, when he came home, he showed him all that the father has. The welcoming, the ring, the clothes, the shoes, the, um, the banquet. He showed him all that God can give you. He did not wait until this child was gone. Remember the story that he said? He said, look, this child of mine was dead, but now alive. You see, he was spiritually dead, but now come back home. So there are a lot of spiritually dead people around us, and they are dead. Shall we bring them back home? And that mandate, we have it from Jesus Christ. To bring back the prodigals and heal their hearts, to refresh and to restore them. It is in this world that people's eternal destiny and purpose can be shaped. So let us not forget that. So let us look at the mandate. Just one of the verses. There are so many of them. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. That is when Jesus Christ um, rose up from the dead and was going to go to the heavens. And these are one of his last words. Mark 16, 15. And Jesus said to them, Is that, is that right? I said Mark 16, verse 15. Thank you. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To every creature. Are you a creature? Are your family a creature? Are your sons and daughters a creature? Are the people in your home, your neighbors, your work colleagues, the people that you come on the bus, are they creatures? 
If they are, it says go into all the world. It doesn't mean that you can travel to every nation in the world. You are in this world, your world that you live in. Go into all the world and preach, meaning tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our mandate. That means our command. But before we go into all the world, we should be prepared. So let me give you some five things in the next 20, 20, 20 25 minutes. I'll give you some five things that we should look at to prepare ourselves in case you said, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't care about my family, whether they die or not, but when they die, I will care so much. Please don't be like that. So let us show you some few things that will make you know that you know. So what should we do to be effective preachers or tellers of the gospel? Number one, have compassion. Compassion is the ability to identify with someone else's situation. Have compassion. Can you identify with how people feel around you? Can you identify with the pain that they are going through? Can you identify with the shame that they are going through? Can you identify with all the struggles that they are going through? It's the ability to identify with someone else's situation. Therefore, when you have the opportunity to share the gospel, demonstrate your genuine desire to help and ask the person what his or her needs are. So when we're talking about sharing the gospel, it's not only when we say go to the street whilst your own people die. I believe in starting from home. I believe in starting in Jerusalem, um, Judea, Samaria, then to the ends of the world. Start from around you. Start from the people that you see very often. Start from the people that you talk to very often, virtually and in person. Start with them before you go. Therefore, when you have an opportunity, have that genuine desire and ask them, what is it that I can do to help you? It may be health issue, that you may have just some advice because some people, when they are sick, their sickness has been tested by the doctors and the clinicians and everything, there's no solution. So the solution got to be a supernatural solution. You got to pray for them. Some people too, when they are sick, they know that they probably have to go and see their GP, but they are so ignorant. Excuse my words, they will not go and they sit and they die. At least go and check up, and if you don't believe the doctor, then pray. Did you hear what I'm saying? Right, so, it could be area of finance. Maybe it's not even much, maybe you could be able, you'll be able to help, maybe you might not be able to help, but you can show that person some a way. Maybe they're messed up with their finances and you need to help them out. Also, maybe you have to pray for them, for God to send money in an unexpected way to do a miracle in their lives. We pray for people like that all the time, in house of peace and in house, and it's happening all the time. Maybe the issue is family issues. They're struggling in their home. They're struggling in their marriage. They're struggling in their relationship with their children. They're struggling with their siblings. Am I the only person who has that? My, I won't say that. So, please, whatever you do, hear their story. And if you can, pray for that person, him or her. Pray for them. People seek answers to their problems, and you have what they need. Yes. That's how we show the love of God. You have what they need. So how can we be effective preachers of the gospel? I said, have compassion. Let's read Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases and among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torment. Remember the word, afflicted with various diseases and torment and those who were demon-possessed epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them all. So we're looking to people who are paralyzed, 
people who were suffering from epilepsy, people who were afflicted and tormented. That means a demonic impression there. So all these kind of, be it physically sick, emotionally sick, and, 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 and demon oppressed, he healed them all. But first, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So in here we say this is supernatural discipleship. That means when you tell somebody about Jesus, find out what their needs are. Pray in faith, believe God, be bold, be confident, and ask God to back you up, and he'll back you up and change lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number two, how can we be effective preachers of the gospel? Demonstrate friendship. Demonstrate friendship. We should be role models of, of kindness and friendship with our neighbors. The unconditional love of God that is shown will attract those who seek to fill the void in their lives with other things. If you make yourself available to them, they will seek you and ask for prayer and want more of God in their lives. Be light in their darkness. Make a difference in someone's life. Amen? Be light in someone's darkness and make a difference in someone's life. And Jesus Christ, in his Sermon on the Mount, he said this, Matthew 5, 14. He said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. If you are light of the world, then people can see that. Be light to people. So that people can walk to you. And sometimes you are in the office and you see somebody, you see the person's face and you think, oh God, it's as if the person want, to, want the world to split for him or her to hide in. Don't just look on and go. Don't just go and talk about what you said, what you heard on TikTok or, or, or the next uh, soap that you watched. When you get the opportunity, go to the person gently. Is everything okay? It's more likely they say, I'm fine. You look at the person and say, I know you're fine. But I know God hears your heart and what's going on. I'll be praying for you. You just go and sit down, wait till lunchtime, and the person is coming to look for you. Because you've sown a seed in their heart, and they know that you have what it takes to be a light to them. You are at that moment the light that they are looking for. You are at that moment the light that is on the hill. They will look for it, they will never hide. And when you help them to come out of that situation, the next moment they come and say, ah, you know what, when I was in this situation, X, Y, Z prayed for me or spoke to me. And my situation changed and they will come and look for you. That is how we are showing the unconditional love of God to people. Number three, you see, people, See people the way God sees them. See people the way God sees them. It is difficult to understand the need of others in our own flesh, and our own mind. But when we learn to see people the way God sees them, it gets easier to help and to feel compassion for the drunkard. It will help and easier to feel compassion for the smelly person that you sit on the bus with. It will be helpful and easier for you to feel the heartbeat of the person with that brilliant intellect and yet so proud, you will see that because the Spirit of God is revealing that to you and you know how to connect with this person and talk to that person. See, seeing people the same way as God sees them means to love them unconditionally. Amen? Amen. To love them unconditionally. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. All my readings that come from the New, International, uh, New King James Version. It says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law, all that, I mean, Moses was saying, and all that God was telling his people, is in this, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. What it means is that we should love them unconditionally. I mean, we should love them the way God will love them. They may sometimes mess up your, I mean, your mind. 
Sometimes we feel like boxing them and that you don't feel like helping them. But you see what? Sometimes you feel like this person, I mean, I live with this person. The person is really, I feel like, you know what, suck it one or something like that. You see, I mean, but whatever it is, that is not what we want to do. We have to love our neighbor than ourselves. Because Ephesians 5 tells us that, look, love is demonstrated in this. You see, I remember I preached this sermon when our brother, I mean, uh, 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 Sam Leary and Ruth Leary were getting married. That nobody who loves takes chance to hurt his own body. Do you understand that? If you are loving your neighbor as yourself, you will not get up and cut yourself with knives or be nasty to yourself, will you? You look at yourself in the mirror and you say, how oh, I look so great, because you love yourself. <laughs> Isn't it? And Jesus gave us that analogy. Paul, the Apostle Paul gave us that analogy in Ephesians 5. So I want us to come to understand that it is all that the law was giving us is fulfilled in one word, even this, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Do you love your neighbor? And you may ask, who is my neighbor? It's not only the next door person. Could be the person that you sleep in the same bed with. Could be the person that you share the same room or house with. Could be the person that you share the same office with. Could be the person that you go to the same school with. Is the person that you probably lead them elsewhere in the community. They are your neighbors. Listen to the story of the Good Samaritan and you know who your neighbor is. That means go at that extra mile to show friendship and see people the way God sees them. Um, number four, my penultimate uh, way that we should learn to be effective preachers of the gospel is pray. Pray. See, we cannot go out and preach the gospel until we have spent time, quality time, relentless time, audacious time with God in prayer. We cannot do that unless we've spent time with God in prayer. We should ask the Holy Spirit to help us to preach the gospel. He will guide us at the right time and with wisdom. Because the person that you are talking to, that they don't hear, did you spend time to pray for God to give you divine connection. These are some of the things that we teach. Now, this is pathway. Spend time with God. Mention the person's name. Oh, God, this person, I've spoken, I've done everything they are not hearing because you're doing it in the flesh. Spend time to pray and say, God, you know, my prayer is not for the person to come back only to faith, but my prayer is that, Father, I bring X, Y, Z before you. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding, prepare the person's heart so that when I open my mouth to tell them that you have to come back home to the Father, they will hear. Did you get that? Spend that time. Unless you spend that time and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to preach the gospel, you are doing well but not well enough. Many people believe that the only thing needed to save the lost is prayer. But, no, but to save so we need to pray and act. Take action. We need to pray and take action. You see, in James chapter 2, verse 14, I mean, write it down. It says that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Hence the reason why many people die and go to hell, eternal damnation, is because we pray, but we fail to act. When I was preparing this, and it came to my mind, I'm thinking, oh God, help me again. I've been praying for some people to come back to faith in God. But then, yeah, who is going to tell them when I love that person? Who's going to tell them when the person is close to my heart? Who is going to tell them to come back to faith? They don't know that person. The person meet them on the street, and in England we say, no, thank you. I don't know you, you're a stranger. Unless the Lord is with you. But then we know the person. You may be afraid. Cast out that spirit of fear. Take it away from it. That person can never kill you or hurt you. 
Be bold and talk to that person. You are praying. So God is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. The most important thing we need to share the love of God and love of Jesus Christ and his message of salvation is the power and the love of God. Let's read Acts chapter 1 verse 8. I always go back to the discipleship pathway. That's when these verses came alive to us. It said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. But you shall receive power. And Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead. So he has given you resurrection power. Resurrection power destroys the work of the enemy. Resurrection power rescues all the power of the enemy and put it in your hand. Whatever power the enemy has, your power is above that. Because Ephesians 4 tells us, tells us that who is he who died? Who is he who was buried? Who is he who went down to the I mean, lower parts of the world? And who is he who came up from it? And when he came up, he gave gifts to people. For some, he made them apostles. For some, he made them prophets. Some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. For the equipment of the saints, so that we can be so strong. So Jesus Christ had to rescue all the power that the enemy has and give it to us so that we can have power over him. That is why we are able to rebuke Satan. We are able to rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ and he can't do anything. That's why we are able to rebuke demons and they fly out of people. Because God has given us power over these things. So they have power, but their power is taken away. The most powerful thing has been taken away. That authority is with us. And therefore... We have to look at the situation and say, you know what? God, you have given me power. That stubborn spirit, that unbelieving spirit, that spirit of grace, I cast it out in Jesus' name and I open their minds. And today I speak in Jesus' name that something should happen. Amen. And it will happen in Jesus' name. Amen. And note where it says you should start from. To be a witness of Jesus Christ. In Jerusalem, your home, in Judea, your community in Samaria, you are going further to your workplace and bus and everything and into the ends of the world. Yeah? Yes. The final point that I want to bring to our mind, how can we be effective preachers of the gospel? Do not judge. Do not judge. You see, many people walk around depressed, alone, or even destroyed. They don't need any more judgment from you. You sink them further. You bury them further. They don't need that from you. Others live lifestyle that displeases God. We know that. But we should never judge. That means that we, can, we cannot say that... We, uh, what I mean is that you can't say that what they've done is wrong. Wrong is wrong, right is right. There's got to be some truth. There's got to be some wrongdoing, right? We have to acknowledge wrongdoing. Let us not justify. Let us not cover it. Let us not parcel it in any other way. Because you may fool me, but you will not fool God. God has standards. Just like in this country, we have standards. When you transgress it, you get punished. But the supernatural love of God will not forever judge you. So what I mean by, by what, what we say we should never judge is this. That don't continuously and permanently pointing, accusing finger at someone who's already down. That's what I mean by don't judge. You've got to have your opinion. You've got to have your opinion in line with the standards of God. But don't continuously pointing fingers. Don't permanently accuse people of their wrongdoing. That is what supernatural love of God does. To forgive and to blot out our sins. Blood that means that you cover it, you wipe it all again, all over. And the Bible says it, or Christian people say remit, or remission of sins. That means you wipe it so that we will not see trace of it again. Yeah? Amen. Doesn't mean that you didn't spill that milk. Doesn't mean that you didn't spill that ink. You did indeed. But then we wipe it all, all over because Jesus Christ has brought that, given us that privilege. 
we know that sin has consequences. And when we come to ourselves, or the prodigal son, when he came to himself, he said, I must return to my father. So when we come to ourselves, we should return to the father in repentance. And he will forgive us. Remember the story again, Luke 15? I said you should read it. You will see how when the guy came to himself, he did not just stay there. Because sometimes the problem that I have Every, every, sometimes some preachers make the story to mean that the guy, when he was sitting by the pig school and watching the pigs, he started filling his mouth with it. I've heard this several times, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, let me go and read it again. Did he really eat that? No, he didn't. He said he longed, he wished that he could eat that. If he ate that, his situation would be worse. He could have poisoned himself. You're already hungry. You're already in a bad state. What are you going to add to it again? So if you find yourself in a bad state, don't make bad situation worse. But come to yourself and return to the Father. For the unconditional love of the Father forgives us. He will welcome us. He will blot out our past and restore us and bring us in relationship with God. Heaven will celebrate that. We should simply love them with the love of God. And remember that even though God hates sin, God loves the sinner. His son Jesus Christ died for them. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, he says this, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent, turn away, come to God. When you come to yourself and you come to yourself and you say, you know what? I am far from God. Sometimes you don't have to go and do some headline sin that everybody know that you 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 are living in sin. When you are far away from God, you know you don't feel God. You don't do godly things. You don't do godly associations. You don't want to come to church. You don't want to read the Bible. You don't want to pray. You don't want to worship. You don't even want to, I mean, hear Pastor Gideon's voice. I call you several times and it always goes to voicemail. And one day when they happen to, I mean, reply, they say, I didn't see it. Really? (laughs) They didn't see it. All right. Let's love them the way God will love them. Do you understand that? They said they didn't see it. They didn't see it. Hello, (laughs) Hannah? Sorry. So, that your sins may be blotted out. I've explained blotted out, covered, taken away. God will not remember. And times of refreshing may come to you. Refresh means that bring you back to where it was before. So that you can operate the way you have to operate. The refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And people will be converted. So conversion takes place in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen? If you want people to change, then we need the presence of the Lord. That's why in this church, we are always praying for the presence of the Lord. Without the presence of the Lord here, we will not change. Finally, I will say that God's love and power in us will allow us to embrace the people that others reject because of their appearances or condition or what they've gotten into. The unconditional love of God will keep us from judging or rejecting others but to guide us to pray and serve them with that compassionate love, with that supernatural love, with that love that does not discriminate, that love that is given out freely no matter what. Shall we say amen to this? Amen. Have you been blessed today? Yes. Good. Shall we uh, stand if you are able to? And we are going to pray for ourselves. If for any reason you think that you want somebody to pray for you, just rush to the front and someone will pray for you. But we're going to pray for ourselves right now. We are going to pray and cry out to God that the fire of God will consume all the indifferences that we have towards the lost. Sometimes we are indifferent. That means you don't feel anything. You don't know what you want to do. We are going to pray and ask God that God 
let your fire consume us. Lord, let your fire consume us. Consume every indifference. Consume every idleness and every apathy in us towards the loss. And pour out your compassion and love in us so that we can love the way you do. Now I want you to pray for yourself right now. Make some noise here. Pray for yourself. I'm going to pray for myself too. Say, God, help me. Fill me with your fire, O oh God. Father, fill me with your fire, O oh God. Consume me with your fire, O oh God. Father God, where I've overlooked, Father God, people who need you. Father God, consume me with your fire. So that, uh, Father God, I will I consume me so that you will burn all the indifference that is in me toward the loss. Pour out your compassion over me. Father God, so that I can also go and show compassion and love to others. Father, help me right now. In the name of Jesus. Keep on praying. Yes, keep on praying. Hallelujah, Lord. Our God will keep his word. It says that if uh, you lift me up, I'll draw all men to you. If you tell people that Jesus loved them, he will save them. So today I'm challenging you to pray. And say, God, give me that passion to go and evangelize and bring a new person. You are the covenant keeping church, God. The house of peace and before you. You are the covenant keeping God. Now ask God. Say, God, I want my people to come to church. Yahweh, Have one or two of you people in your mind. God. Pray for them and say, God, help me to bring them to church. Help them to bring them to the house of peace. Help them to bring them to the discipleship pathway. Help me to bring them so that they can be reintegrated with God.